Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. Music is a universal language that often brings people back to a feeling, time, or event in their lives. In this episode of Your History, Your Story, we will be speaking with Roger Hall, who developed a website that preserves historical American music. Roger is a composer and music preservationist who holds a bachelor's degree in music theory and composition, an MA in ethnomusicology, and a PhD in musicology. Roger has a passion for many genres of music, with a particular affinity for choral groups folk music, and ballads. His biggest passion, however, is to preserve historical American music so it will survive for future generations to study and enjoy. I'd now like to welcome Roger Hall to our show. Welcome, Roger. Hi, Hank. Good to be here. Very glad to have you. I'm not a musician. I wish I was, but I do enjoy music, all different types of music. So when we got connected with you, and the work you've done in that art, and the interest that you have in music preservation and film preservation, we thought, what a great guest for our show. So, Roger, let me start off by asking you, where did you grow up? Bloomfield. I spent the first about uh, 20 years living in Bloomfield. Okay, so that's in North New Jersey, not far from where I live now, and uh, I actually have family roots in that town, so I'm very interested in to hear from what I saw you graduated from high school in 1960. Tell us, what was it like in Bloomfield, New Jersey, northern New Jersey, in the 1950s with all the music and all the things that we think about the 1950s? What was your experience? Well, what I remember is we used to talk, especially with the friends I had, we used to talk about the latest record we heard on the radio, for example. But not only that, but we actually, in Bloomfield High School at that time, they had a rock group that formed. It's kind of a doo-wop group, what they call doo-wop now, rhythm and blues. Rick Randell and the Rockets or something like that. Rick uh, was a uh, senior in high school, and he formed this uh, quartet, I think it was. And they went around and they made a couple of records, actually. And they were really good, I thought. They were very popular. And because they were in the school, they were seniors in high school. Of course, we were very proud of the fact that we had a you know, vocal group in our high school. So, I mean, it was, you know, some of the kids were actively involved in creating music, not just listening to it. And it was people like that that were actually, you know, performing music or recording it. It was just local. They just sang locally, I think. But, you know, it was just the music was something we talked about a lot, music and sports, mostly, especially with the guys. Uh, that's what we would talk about. And it was just an important part of our uh, you know school days. In addition to the subjects we were studying, you know, it was our recreation, you might say. And you know, we had dances, of course, and we'd have favorite songs that we would hear in the dances that, you know, they would play records a lot of times. And I remember certain songs. I, I used to like the vocal groups, especially the R&B or doo-wop groups, uh, the Moonglows, the Flamingos, uh, a lot of those groups. I, I really enjoyed them. I, I liked the ballads, especially. I always liked slow songs for some reason that, uh, you know, whenever a slow song came on, I, I really I sort of lit up, you know. <laughs> uh, it, it's just something that appealed to me. So, Roger, was this the time that you yourself started to take an interest in songwriting and performing? Funny, because in my high school yearbook, it said I was an amateur songwriter. But that's (laughs) I only wrote about five or six song lyrics. So, I mean, I wasn't really uh, very far along. I was just the beginning. I even made a demo record with a friend of mine. And uh, we recorded on tape a couple of my songs to uh, instrumental accompaniment. Uh, pop songs. Uh, one was Sleepwalk, which was uh, Santo and Johnny. They had a they played steel guitar. Uh, it was an instrumental, and I put words to it. So we sang that, and then we also sang an upbeat number, which was a, a popular 
song at that time called The Swag. It was one of those dances that were popular. There were a lot of these uh, dances that were popular with teenagers back in the 50s, mainly because of the TV show American Bandstand. Uh, so I actually came up with some kind of a dance, but uh, I came up with some steps, I think, and how I could uh, introduce the song and then have this dance that the kids would take up. And I thought, well, maybe on American Bandstand, they could do it. Of course, that never happened. But we did make a recording of it. Mm -hmm. Let me back up just a, a little bit here. This interest in music that you've had, did you have a, a parent or aunt, uncle, grandparent who was musical? No, not really. My mother liked music a lot, mainly just listening to the radio, and she would sing along with some of the songs she liked. And I have to say that my parents divorced when I was very young. I was only 10 years old. So I was living with a single mom for many years. So she would not only sing along with the radio, but she also bought records. Uh, we had a little record player that she used. And so she would play these records. And so I think that was maybe some kind of an influence on me. But also talking to kids in high school, uh, you know, the kinds of music that we like, we would talk about, you know, the latest hit song we heard. It was mainly just talking to people about it and also listening to the radio that got me uh, really involved. And also, I should mention in high school, I sang in the varsity choir. Uh, there was a teacher there. His name is Mr. Diller, Ralph Diller wonderful guy, a very enthusiastic teacher. And that's very important, I think, because I, I did teaching too. It's very important to be enthusiastic about what you're teaching, I think. And he got me inspired just by listening in his class. And he would play uh, a lot of classical music, which I had never heard before. And I remember going up to him after one of the classes and saying how much I liked the music. He said, well, why don't you sing in our choir? <laughs> so uh, I didn't think I could sing that well, but he said, oh, yeah, you do fine. And so I, I really enjoyed being in the varsity choir in my senior year. He sort of, you know, got me going, so to speak, in high school. I wasn't writing music then, of course, but just participating in singing in a, in a choir. And I think that's important for especially young people to be involved, if you like music, to get involved in music, either in a choir or in the orchestra. Because you can keep that. Many people I've talked to have said, even though they may not play the instrument now or may not sing, it was those experiences they really enjoyed while they were in school. Absolutely. And you didn't really play an instrument. You didn't really know how to write music. But you got around music. You were around it, whether it be on the radio or in the case of having a music teacher who sort of said, hey, let's. you, you want to join the choir, uh, you'll be around music even more. Just being around it can be inspirational, and particularly when you have a person who sort of takes you under their wing or inspires you. But you make a good point when you say that when you see somebody who is passionate about something, that it lights a fire because it's contagious, isn't it? Yeah, oh, definitely. I would say that's very true. And I, I can also say after I got out of high school, I went into the military. I, I joined the army. I was in the army for three years and I was stationed in Germany mm -hmm. uh, for two years, two of the three years I served. And it was there that I really got involved in music directly with a couple of army buddies. We had a very good musician in our unit. Uh, he was from Texas. His name was Jake Smith. <laughs> Great name. Uh, he played guitar, acoustic guitar, and he was like a country singer, but he had a terrific voice. So I, I knew he could sing well because he used to sing in, in the barracks. So I said, why don't we make a, a demo record? So I wrote a couple of songs. Uh, we worked together on the music, sort of like Lennon McCartney, you know, who did what? You know, we sort of worked it together. And uh, we made a, a tape of a couple of my songs. And I foolishly thought, you know, well, I'm going to get a record company interested in this. And I actually, while I was in Germany, I went to a German record company with these songs, which, of course, they had no interest in at all. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought I would try at least uh, to do it. And one particular song I want to mention, it's called Dream World. That's really the first song I wrote. And uh, I looked up, and this was 1961. And I said, why did I write this song? It talks about a place where money means less, a place made for happiness, and talking about violence is gone and freedom lives on. Well, it turns out the Berlin Wall had just been built at that same time. 
And in the Army, I worked, I had top secret clearance. I worked in what was called the War Plans Office. Mm -hmm. It was an engineering unit, so they were talking about where they would go in the case of a war with Russia mm -hmm. uh, from East Germany at that time, or from Berlin. And so they had us really concerned. I don't think people here in the States realize that uh, at that time, a lot of people in the army especially thought that, that there was a war that was coming or could be coming because of the Berlin Wall being put up. So uh, we were very concerned about that. And I was thinking about that. And that's when I put that in that song, calling it Dream World, I was thinking of a place that was better than you know what was going on at that time. So in a sense, I was affected by the political scene at that time with you know the conflict between the East and the West in Germany, you know, it really was connected to, you know, an event that actually happened. And do you have a recording of that song to this day? I do. Yeah, I still have it. Yeah. It's not a great quality, of course. And it's a, I don't know what kind of, I don't know if you call it a rock song, a country song, because Jake Smith, he was really a country singer, mm -hmm. but he, he knew enough about rock music that he could, you know, get the rock beat into it. So it sort of a cross between country and rock, I guess you could say. But I, I of course, I've liked it over the years. I played it in various places, but uh, I never really got it released. I did try when I came back from the army. I went to New York. I went to the Brill Building, which is a famous place where songwriters uh, did their work and tried to find a record company. They had record agents there who would... Uh, you know, release it. But of course, they never did. Uh, it was very tough in those days to get your songs uh, released by a record, even a small record company. It had to have what they call a hook, something that would attract people. You know, it could be a novelty song or some kind of a rhythm uh, that they thought was would, would catch the public, you know, get their interest. And uh, this song, I guess, just didn't have any hook that they, that they could see that they could use. Um, so... <laughs> And I tried with a couple of other songs, too, that I that I wrote. The song, actually, I like best is called The Soho Serenade, which I went to London on one of the leaves when I was in the Army. Uh, it was in January. It was really a terrible time, a very bad winter. They had a tremendous snowstorm in London. And I remember walking around in the snow with no boots or anything. But uh, I really enjoyed being in London. And so I wrote this song about Soho, which was the entertainment area in London, talking in general about, you know, how much fun it is to go to the coffee bars as they were popular at that time. I wrote the lyrics to that. I came back and I, and I worked on a melody. And that's actually the first song I got recorded in Bloomfield. They had a re recording studio on Broad Street in Bloomfield, 23 Broad Street, that was the address. Star Recording Studio is called. And uh, they were struggling, as many recording studios did. Yeah. And I remember the guy who I uh, worked with, he was a fast buck guy. Um, he would say, you know, give me the money. I'm going to pay the musicians. And I give him some money. And I found out later he was do using that money to pay for his electric bill. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, he, he was really pretty shifty. Uh, he was a musician himself, too, a good musician, too. But uh, I really had trouble with him. And he'd always delay. He'd always say, you know, well, we're going to record it next week. And I'd say, OK. And I'd come in and he'd say, no, uh, we've been too busy. We'll do it you know, in another couple of weeks. So it took quite a while for them to do it. But the thing I appreciated the most was the singer who sort of sounded like Dionne Warwick, mm -hmm. who came from East Orange, New Jersey, by the way. And her name is Ethel Regan. And she was a terrific singer. And she told me that when they recorded the song, they worked on it for hours, well into the night. And she loved the song so much, it didn't bother her. But she didn't get paid for it. At the end of the session, you know, you're supposed to get paid for that work. Oh, well, yeah. And he didn't pay her. He, he made some excuse. So I gave her money myself because I just felt that she was being uh, you know, ignored by this guy. And it, it really annoyed me. And I and I bawled him out, too, because I said, you know, she deserved to be paid for her work. And I, I still think that her you know, performance of it is really great. It's just a, a case where, you know, somebody comes in you never heard of before and does a terrific job. Right. So when did you make that recording in Bloomfield? That was in 1965. 
But you said there was a recording you did in, when you were over in Germany as well. Was that before or after? That was before, that, right? Before. That was in 61. Okay. And that was just tape. It, we just made a, an audio tape. Oh, tape. We didn't actually make a record. I made a record later. I had a record made from the tape. See, in those days, what you would do often is you'd make a tape, a, an audio tape. You'd bring it to a place, a studio or a recording studio, and they could make a record. Or you'd have to go to New York, actually. I had to go to New York to do that, where they uh, you know, they made uh, recordings from the tape. You'd bring the tape in, and they'd make, in those days, 45 records were, were the most common. Right. They'd make a 45 record. I still have the 45 from the Soho Serenade. I still have it in my collection. It's a demo record. And demo records, if you play them too much, they wear out. They're not meant to last forever. They're just for uh, you know presentation to give it to a record company or an artist. So they're not meant to last, but I, I've carefully preserved that 45 because it was the first one I did. I was so proud of it. I even have a picture of me holding it. It was wow. the first record I had. Excellent. So you're talking about preserving. So I think at, at some point you felt like maybe the you know recording uh, music for yourself, your own writing and recording, maybe wasn't the whole story that maybe you were going to work on preserving music and music history and eventually film history as well. Can you tell us what made you switch to preservation from actually writing and performing music? Well, that it took a while for me to get into that. Uh, it actually started when I was in college, uh, not in undergraduate. I went to Rutgers in Newark and got a degree in music theory and composition, mostly in composition. And I wasn't involved in preservation then, but when I went into graduate school, I went to Binghamton University in New York State, and I studied what is called ethnomusicology. And what that means is a study of a folk culture, and not just the US, but anywhere in the world. But my interest was a, a group that I had never heard of called the Shakers, uh, a religious group, communal group, that came from England originally and settled in America and had at one time thousands of members, uh, mostly in the Northeast, in, in the 19th century, especially, and, and into the 20th century, too. There were still shakers al around when I was studying. But I got interested in the music because it was simple. It had very good melody and the words were very important. They were simple lyrics, but they, they really had a, a good message, I thought. So I got interested in, in looking into the music and seeing what was out there and collecting it. And then I got to speak with the Shakers. They were mainly women at that time who were singers also. And they sang some of their songs for me. And I, and I actually put that in my uh, research paper that uh, I did for my master's at Binghamton in ethnomusicology. So that's really when I got started. I was trying to preserve their music because... There wasn't much of the music that was available at that time. A lot of people had never heard the music. Only one particular song, Simple Gifts, which was popular. A lot of folk uh, people like Judy Collins and uh, Bob Beers, they made arrangements of that song. And Pete Seeger, I think he sang it too. Uh, it was a popular song in the folk uh, world. Uh, but that was the only song. Most people never heard of anything else. And most people never heard of anything about that song. There was a man who wrote that song. It's not anonymous. As many times they used to say, you know, anonymous folk tune. It was written by Joseph Brackett, elder. He was an elder of their church in Maine. And he wrote the song in 1848. I, see, I start throwing out these dates. <laughs> <laughs> that's oh, that's, that's part of the preservation. <laughs> yeah, you're good. So, so Roger. You took this college curriculum and you felt like this preservation was very important. You studied the Shakers. Very, you know, very interesting because if you didn't preserve Shaker music somehow, it would have just disappeared, right? I don't know. Are there are there any Shakers in this world today? Do you know? Or Well, believe it or not, they're down to two. Two Shakers living in Maine uh, and uh, a man and a woman. The woman is is very old and not very in not good health. The, the man is, is still doing fine. But that's it. I mean, when they're gone, it's over. Uh, and they wow. were around for over 200 years. So wow. a long history. They started during the revolution, American Revolution. They came from England and they were persecuted because they thought they were pro-British at that time. 
But their leader was a woman. Mother Ann Lee was her name. Very charismatic woman, from what I've read. She would sing songs that people would write down. She couldn't read or write, so she couldn't write down the songs, but somebody else could. And some of her songs have been preserved in their books. They used to write the tunes in their uh, manuscript books, the words and the music. And that's how I was able to help to preserve it by going into these original books. Because in ethnomusicology, you want to get to the original source if you can. Mm -hmm. And so I would go to the libraries. I went to libraries all over the country doing research. I went to the Library of Congress and the New York Public Library and, and many other libraries because their books were scattered all around. And I looked through them and I found, you know, music that I could use. I couldn't do everything naturally, but there were certain tunes that I would pick out and I would do in concerts. I made recordings of their music. Very good. So that's the Shakers, but now you e extended this to all kinds of music and preserving music. Now you mentioned about research. So you're not just recording a song and, and putting it onto your website or something like that. You're actually researching what the music's about. Who are the people who developed the music? Who are the people who incorporated it into their culture or their or their faith or anything like that? When did this become a broader passion for you? Well, uh, going on through education, after I got my master's degree at Binghamton, I went to Cleveland and I was working on my PhD in musicology, which is another area of music, which is more detail uh, analysis of music and not just writing the, about the music, but you know, talking about how it was put together. Uh, it's more technical, in other words. Uh, that was my major. But again, I was still shutting the shakers. So when I got to Cleveland, I was looking around uh, for material. And this happenstance, some, some of these things just happen. Uh, while I was there, I had a uh, assistantship, a government a grant to pay for my tuition. Mm -hmm. And the responsibility is I was supposed to be a teaching assistant for some professor. It turned out the professor I assisted turned out to be one of the most prominent disc jockeys in America. His name was Bill Randall. And he was a very popular Cleveland disc jockey. Very important for rock and roll because he's the man who introduced Elvis Presley on national TV in 1956. I watched that show. I remember it as a teenager. <laughs> and I was quite impressed with Elvis in 1956 on his debut. So, uh, you know, being able to work for this guy. And this guy had incredible knowledge of popular music. He knew about the history of music. And he got me inspired by that, by talking with him. He would talk to me for long periods of time, telling me about various artists and various uh, kinds of music that he would go to record them, because he, he really had a very inquisitive mind. He did a 10-album set on the Shaker history called the Shaker Heritage. Basically, it was just what they call a field recording. In other words, he went to the Shaker Village and had them talk to him and, and to sing also. The two of the 10 records had music. This is how preservation works. Many years after that, a record company came to me and said, would you do the music portion of that set for us to release? And it turns out it was Rounder Records, which was a very big folk label. Had people like Alison Krauss, who's still popular, I think, today. And they released a two CD set of the music portion from that 10 album set that I edited and I also added some interviews that I had done with the Shakers. So that's the kind of preservation. That's how you can help to preserve the music by having recordings. I'm very big on recordings. Yes. I've done a lot of work with making recordings of music I have uh, in my collection. I think that is great because there's often probably not one-stop shopping for these types of things. It's uh you know, you, you have to search far and wide and you did you did your research and you had to, to look all over the place. You had a, your education was very specific to doing types of things like that. You mentioned ethnomusicology. You've now developed a website where you are you are bringing a lot of this preservation into play. But before we talk about your website, what really is the heart of preservation, music preservation for you? What speaks from your heart about it? 
Well, basically, I would say communication to other people. You know, I could love something, you know, I say it's the greatest thing I've heard, but somebody else may not be interested. But somebody could be interested, especially a young person, a student. I've had college students especially write to me about some area they're doing in, in college and they want some information. And I figure that they could get as inspired as I did in my work. It's no guarantee, of course. They could be just doing it for their course. But the idea is to inspire, especially young people, and teachers, especially teachers, because teachers are the way a lot of this information gets, you know, spread, especially to, you know, students. Uh, I think it's very important that teachers become aware of American music from the past. You know, most people, if you talk about early American music, they say, okay, Yankee Doodle or Battle Hymn of the Republic. They can only name a couple of tunes. And yet there's a tremendous amount of music that was done in earlier America. And it's good music. And it's a kind of music I think people can enjoy today. I can to give you one example of the very first songwriter we know about. His name was Francis Hopkinson, who was actually a delegate from New Jersey and signed the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> he was a Renaissance man. He was a musician, but he was also a lawyer and a statesman. He was a friend of Benjamin Franklin. But he, he was very much involved in music. And he wrote a song called My Days Have Been So Wondrous Free, 1759. That's the earliest song in America that we have a record of. And most people never heard of him other than music specialists. Uh, most people have never heard. It's been recorded. The song has been recorded by various people. But uh, most people never hear something like that. And there's another man I could mention who I did a lot of work on. William Billings, who was the first composer uh, to write uh, for chorus. Uh, he lived in Boston. He wasn't really a full-time musician, as many of those people weren't. He was actually a tanner. And uh, he also had to take care, believe it or not, of the hogs in the street. <laughs> <laughs> that was part of his yeah. job. He worked for the city of Boston at that time. This was back in the revolutionary time. Mm -hmm. uh, that was another one of his jobs. He didn't have a lot of money, in other words. He did the music on the side. And that's what I found. A lot of people involved in music in the early years did it as kind of a, almost like a hobby that they they really love music so much. They, they had to get involved in it, especially writing it. So that's a fascinating area, I think, that uh, is part of the preservation. And I do talk about that on my website. That's AmericanMusicPreservation.com. I actually formed a uh, an agency called the Center for American Music Preservation, which the the idea is, or the motto says, making American music come alive again. Again is the important word. Very, I love that. So when you think about today's music, I mean, it's it's all out there. So you're, you're are you preserving music from a certain point backward? Yeah, I uh, I don't get into the current music so much. Because, you know, it's everywhere. I mean, you don't really have to, you know, get into it too much. Uh, I'm more interested, and I'm, I don't want to deal just in obscurities. Uh, some people would think, well, that music is too obscure. Uh, I deal with popular music, too, and especially film music is a tremendous interest of mine. I, I, I've been running a uh, magazine or an e-zine online since 1998, Film Music Review, in which uh, I have a couple of writers who, reviewers who do... Uh, soundtrack reviews, and I do them myself. And uh, I also started something uh, called the Sammy Film Music Awards. Now, Sammy is Sammy Kahn, who was a well-known Oscar-winning uh, lyricist. He actually got four Oscars for his songs, all for songs that Frank Sinatra recorded. He was a big friend uh, with Frank, Frank Sinatra, loved his, his songs. But I named it after him because he received more uh, nominations for Oscars than any other songwriter. I think it was 26. Uh, and he got four Oscars for his songs, uh, all from recordings that Frank Sinatra made. Uh, that's uh, All the Way, Call Me Irresponsible, High Hopes, and um, Three Coins in the Fountain. Those are the four. So I named it after him because I thought that was important. And what I do each year is I pick the best recordings, not, you know, in the movie, uh, or of course they're from the movies, but the best recordings of uh, film music and sometimes also the songs. Well, I haven't done the songs very much because I, I really don't think so many of the film songs today are so good. 
But um, I did that for a long time, for over 30 years. Every year I would pick these, uh, what I consider the best of the year. Uh, and, and especially for older film music. And there's really a, a quite a, a large audience now for older uh, film music from the past, from the so-called golden age, like Gone with the Wind and things like that, Casablanca. Also up to more current times, like especially John Williams, who I, I love his music. And um, I, I was very pleased to get a piece of, of a score. He sent me a page from the score to E.T. Ah. Uh, as a thank you, because I did a tribute to him on radio, a birthday tribute to him many years ago in, in Boston on WGBH. Yep. And I sent him a tape. And about a year later, <laughs> I got an answer. And he thanked me. He said he really enjoyed listening to the tape because I played not just his famous you know, scores from E.T., movies like that or Jaws, but also from his TV days. He started out on writing for TV in the days uh, in the 50s with uh, the famous show uh, that had jazz music in it, uh, Peter Gunn. Mm -hmm. He was a pianist on Peter Gunn back in the 50s, Henry Mancini's great score, a jazz score for that uh, TV series. So I played some of that, and I, I think he was probably very pleased about that because that's something people don't usually uh, recognize. Exactly. Roger, recently we lost a songwriting great, Burt Bacharach. What did he mean to you, Is his influence in music? Well, he meant a lot to me because I followed him from the very early years in the 60s. One of the early songs that, that he did was recorded called Make It Easier on Yourself, sung by Jerry Butler. I loved that song. I had the LP. I played it over and over again. And I didn't know anything about him at that time. But, you know, as it went through the 60s and he had, you know, so many hit songs, you know, what the world needs now is love. And love. the look of love was actually when I was dating my now wife, <laughs> that was our song, The Look of Love. And not sung by Dusty Springfield. That was the hit song. It was sung by a uh, French singer with a little whispery kind of voice, Claudine Lorger, who actually married uh, Andy Williams. Really? Yeah, she's known for, because of that. But she wasn't a great singer. But I mean, we just loved that record. And we still have it, actually. Throughout the 60s, I followed almost every one of his songs, even into the 70s. One of my favorite songs from the 70s, Something Big. I was just playing that the other day, uh, thinking about him. Uh, I just love his ability to write appealing melodies. Uh, the tune is important. As he, he said in his book, I'm reading his book now, by the way. It's called Anyone Who Had a Heart. Uh, he said that one of his teachers, when he was studying classical music, uh, he said he was concerned because he actually wrote a, a melody that people might enjoy. And his teacher said, never be ashamed to write a tune that people enjoy. And I, I feel the same way, that melody is really the key to most music. Most uh, music that people enjoy and remember, it's the melody. It's the tune that matters. So I, I, I really admired him a great deal. I actually went to see him. When we were in Cleveland, uh, we went to one of those uh, theater, theater in the round revolving stage. And it was so funny to watch him. He was there with Anthony Newley, the British uh, singer. They did a wonderful show, the two of them. They, you know, they, they split the program. When he was on stage, Bert Bacharach, he was playing the piano, standing up, and the musicians were behind him. So he had to, you know, he had to cue them with his hand behind his back <laughs> and play the piano at the same time. And he did it very well. I mean, he never missed a beat. I mean, I just, I was so amazed at that. He was such a talented performer as well as, uh, you know, a great songwriter. So I, I really admired him a great deal, uh, especially in the 60s when he was the most popular in the beginning. Uh, and even later on, I followed his career. But, you know, he was just, uh, to me, and reading his book, it, it confirms it, that he went through some of the same difficulties that I went through in my youth because he was very shy. I was very shy in school. I didn't have many friends. He didn't have many friends. Uh, and he was in the military, and he got involved in music in the military. I did too. Obviously very different. He was obviously much more, uh, he had a much bigger career than I had. But I mean, just those similarities, you know, have special meaning for me, because if you like somebody as much as that, and you find out that they had some similar experiences, 
especially in their younger years, you can relate to that. Definitely. You know, he's going to be missed. When I was a kid growing up in the 60s and 70s, almost every song that was popular on the radio was something that <laughs> it was his. Just good music, good, good music. But Roger, do you have any personal favorite types of music that you have preserved? Uh, yeah, I do. It may not be the most popular music, but I've always been interested in chorus, you know, groups of people singing together. And I don't mean, you know, in a, in a rock and roll kind of singing, although that's that's fine, too. But it's in the choruses uh, of people that like to sing like classical music and maybe popular music, too, in choruses. And I should mention, I worked with a, a group in the, where I live in Stoughton, Massachusetts, Old Stoughton Musical Society. It turns out to be the oldest musical society in America, founded in 1786. That's before the Constitution was written. Yes, they were singing. Uh -huh. And it, started, it, it was a group that started with just a bunch of men getting together in taverns, mainly, and drinking and singing and singing and drinking. <laughs> That's what they were doing. But it was it was religious music they were singing. That sounds sort of in contrast. <laughs> but they were uh, they were really d dedicated to music and they were in a famous singing contest with another chorus, a church chorus. And they won the chorus after they sang the Hallelujah Chorus from Handel's Messiah from memory and with no instruments. Now, I define people today doing that. That was amazing for me to read that. I couldn't believe it. And that, obviously, they won the contest after they did that. <laughs> I wonder how many pints they had before they did that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was quite a time that they had at that time. They, uh, they really enjoyed singing. And that group uh, continued on, of course, then it became quite large. In the beginning, they wouldn't accept women because they had drinking and the women didn't like that. But then they did away with the drinking and then the women joined and they eventually had a very large chorus, over 100 singers. Uh, and when I got involved in it in the 1970s, they were down to about, uh, I think, 50 or 60 in the chorus. And it, it's still going on, but it's uh, struggling today. It's hard to keep a chorus like that going. But the kind of music they sang was choral music from America. Almost all of it was American music. A lot of it composed by New England musicians. So it was local, a lot of local music. And uh, that's what really, I think, got me uh, in the preservation especially, is trying to preserve the choral music of America. That's really the beginning and the longest running music in our history is a music for chorus not just for a solo singer, but for choruses. That has been the longest tradition. It goes way back to the you know colonial days. I love that. You know, I've talked about this to other guests, but the, the whole goal of our show, uh, our podcast is it's your history, your story. It's to stress the importance of the fact that everybody has a story, uh, that whether you're a famous person or not so famous person, that you, you've got a story to tell, whether it be yours or somebody in your family tree. You could say the same thing about music, can't you? And, uh, you know, particularly when you say choral music, the songs are, are telling stories and you have to preserve stories for future generations. Otherwise, it's lost, isn't it? Of course, definitely. And one way you preserve it, in addition to what you write about it, is recording. And I started a record company, which is just basically my own uh, effort. It's called American Music Recordings Collection, AMRC. And I've released about 50 CDs of uh, all kinds of American music. It's only music I have uh, you know, rights to. I, I don't do uh, you know, other people's music and no popular music because I don't have the rights to those. But uh, it's all historic and it's all preservation because what I'm trying to do is make recordings available, especially for teachers and students, where they can actually hear the music. You can read about it, write about it, but I think it's important to hear it. That's really the most important thing is to be able to hear the music. So I have these CDs of all kinds of music from uh, American history on this, uh, on this label that are available. It's on the website. It's all listed. And it covers uh, the range from the colonial days right up through my music. I have a couple of my CDs of my music on there. 
uh, including shaker music that I have arranged. So uh, it covers a, a broad space of time. I have some of my radio show. I was on radio many times in Boston uh, doing shows, especially for film music, but also uh, popular songwriters like Irving Berlin, George Gershwin, Cole Porter, Johnny Mercer. I did many of those on a show that used to be on called Music America. Ron Del Chiesa is a wonderful friend of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to go on his show a lot and do special tributes to songwriters or to uh, film music. Oscars, I did the Oscar show. Every year we predicted what the music awards might be. And I would play Oscar music from the past. So uh, that, that's, you know, I, I don't like to say I'm just working in the past. I'm working in today as well. You know, I can just feel your enthusiasm. Uh, you're just really so passionate about the work you're, that you have done, but also the work that you are doing now. And, you know, I think, I think back, you know, when you said, oh, well, you made a, a recording and you, you made a, an album and, you know, maybe it, it didn't take off or what have you. What if you had gotten discouraged and just said, you know, I'm going to do something else. I'm, you know, it's not work and I'm going to figure something else. Just think of what work wouldn't have been done. You know, all the preservation that teachers have access to, to you know, just music to that people can to listen to and, and it brings them back to a, a bygone era, even to an era that, we don't know much about or a culture or a religion that we don't much know much about to have that. It's almost like a, a living dictionary of music or encyclopedia, maybe more aptly uh, that you've done that and you didn't get discouraged and you actually pursued an education that, you know, sort of enriched your ability to preserve music for, for years and years to come. Do you have any future projects that you have in mind? Well, uh, that's hard to answer because uh, I do tend to get fixated on certain things <laughs> and really uh, become obsessed with something. It's hard to say. Right now, I'm working a lot since I just turned 80, believe it or not. I'm, I'm actually two two weeks older than President Joe Biden. <laughs> and I'm a little bit younger than Paul McCartney, who's also 80. So I'm in quite a quite a distinguished group, I guess you could say. But uh, you know, I obviously I'm not going to take on a project. It's going to take me years and years. Uh, you know, I might not last that long. But uh, what I'm really trying to do now, what I did actually for my birthday as a kind of present to myself, is I look back to my own music uh, career, and I wrote actually a collection of ten chapters in a book I call Songs of Survival. Songs have made me survive. I had some very traumatic times in my young years with my family getting divorced and my music career not going anywhere. I was very discouraged. And uh, I was actually, I had a serious mental problems there for a while. Mm -hmm. I had to seek uh, medical help. So I, I, I think about how music has carried me through life and, and kept me going, really. And it has been a survival, SOS. That's really been my life in, in a sense capitalizing on music carrying me through life when i've been really down i listened to certain music and it helped keep me going and i'm sure that's happened to other people too and one of the things that my wife is continually amazed about i tell her when i feel down i listen to sad music and she can't understand that why would you listen to sad music if you're feeling you know kind of sad yourself well there's something about it i don't know if it's the deep emotion involved in it you know, I'm sometimes in tears when I hear some of these songs, but that helps. It's almost like a cleansing of your soul. You're listening to sad music. You're feeling sad. You're crying, maybe. And then you feel better. That's the thing that happens to me. After I go through that, I feel sort of refreshed in a way. It's kind of amazing. I can't answer why that happens, but that is the way I react to it. It's almost like the music sort of absorbs some of what you're feeling and plays it back to you. So it becomes more real, maybe helps you to grieve more thoroughly and, you know, find some beauty and release in it at the same time. I think that's, that's kind of interesting. You know, what song always gets me to this day, if I ever listen to it is the, I know Barbara Streisand made it famous, but memories, mm -hmm. that song always, always gets me, you know, because you can apply it to any maybe time or people in your life who are, 
you know, no longer with you or that that's a time that's passed and it's very sad, but it's such a beautiful song at the same time. I'd sing it for you, but, uh, you know, I think my computer screen would crack. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know what you're saying. And the thing is, I've taught classes. I, I used to teach uh, adult education, especially. That was my favorite. And talking to seniors, because they're very honest. You know, young people tend to be, re, you know, reluctant to, you know, express themselves in class. Older people don't feel any resistance to that. They would tell me things like you just said. They would mention a song and say, this had a special meaning for me or my husband or whatever. And I really enjoyed that. In fact, I'm going to be doing a lecture later this year called Going Home, in which I'm going to talk about how songs can make you go home in a sense of going back to your past and thinking about things, and not always sad things, but happy things too, happy times that music can help you remember those things from your past. I think that's important for many people to, to realize that, that music can have a very uh, beneficial effect on you. You know, it isn't just something you put in the background, but you, you know, you can really, like you mentioned memories, you think about your past when you hear that song. You do, and, you do. And I, I think uh, smells, music, sometimes, just a voice of somebody or, or something could bring you back to some place. But I think for me, music brings me back when I hear songs that were from my early days of driving, when I had a little bit more independence, I used to have AM 77 on my radio and my 66 Chrysler. And, <laughs> and uh, I listened to all those songs that, you know, disco that came in and, and I got to admit I never would tell, tell my friends this, but I actually liked a lot of the disco music too. <laughs> I wouldn't admit it and I wouldn't buy a disco album, but I like it. And, um, I know I know what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I had the same thing. I like disco to some extent, not all of it, but you know, it was catchy stuff. Groups like ABBA, which I guess has come back again. Oh, yeah. You know, there were a lot of disco things that, uh, you know, I like to listen to, but you're right. I mean, there was a lot of negativism about it and some people. There because was. I thought you know, it was they thought it was superficial, I guess. But you know, that's the thing about even when I was teaching, I would tell people, if you like some music, don't be ashamed to listen to it. You don't have to tell your friends if they're gonna be giving you an argument. But if you enjoy music, you should listen to it. Don't ever feel like you know somebody's gonna tell you what you should listen to. I would never do that. Like I loved the Bee Gees and I loved Crosby, Stills and Nash. I was all over the place. I had, you know, popular music and I like some classical music. I had a harpsichord record in my dorm room that I used to study to, you know, mm -hmm. it was kind of like it, better than white noise. It was just <laughs> beautiful music, <laughs> which I like, but music is something that it does bring you back. And, um, you know, the fact that you're preserving it is so wonderful. Let me ask you this, Roger, what do you want your legacy to be and the work that you've done in music? Oh, well, that's uh, difficult to answer quickly, but um, I really would like to have people just be aware of the things that I have done. And you may not be interested in all of the things or even many of the things, but to be aware of what I'm trying to do. My mission is to try and preserve American music. And it sounds a little bit maybe... Uh, chauvinistic to say just American. I mean, I like other music from other countries too, but I just feel like there's a need to, uh, you know, preserve, especially music from the past that people are not aware of. You know, there's no reason, there's no need to, you know, try to preserve disco music. I mean, that's still out there, or, you know, rock and roll. Yeah. You can get those recordings everywhere online or any place, but some of this music that I've been doing, you can't find anywhere else. You know, in some cases I have the only copies of the music. So, I mean, I hope that, you know, maybe people by looking at my website and, and especially writing to me, I would appreciate, especially teachers or people who are really involved in music, writing to me and, and just to ask questions, or, you know, just to find out what's available. I think that's how it will continue on. I can't do it all myself. I can't reach everybody, obviously. But, you know, with the Internet being what it is now, you know, you can get to people. It's not that hard, you know, to reach people online. Uh, you can write to them. And uh, and I would like, you know, this music to be distributed more, especially from colleges and schools, 
In fact, I've even offered uh, some of my collection that they could have for their library if they uh, they wanted yep. so that the students can learn it because the young people are the future after all, right? Uh, that's the future. And if these young people never hear any of this music, how are they ever going to know about it? You're right. And it's really, it's up to teachers, I think, to uh, inspire the students by including music, whatever courses they're teaching, especially history. That was my great... Music and history were my two favorite subjects in high school. Nice. Nice. Uh, of course, history is my, is my big thing. And I think history for me is like music is for you. But you have to be a historian to be a music preservationist. So you're a combination of both. So thank you for all the work that you do, Roger. And please give us that website again for people to check out. It's AmericanMusicPreservation.com. We'll put that in the show notes as well, along with some sample music from you. Tell us what those uh, what those songs would be. Yeah, well, one is the one I mentioned, the Soho Serenade, sung by Ethel Reagan, and the other is Free as a Breeze. It's a jazz song sung by a demo singer, Johnny Mazziotti. I think that was his name. He just did the demo recording. I recorded that uh, around the same time by the same recording studio it wasn't in bloomfield it was in another town orange new jersey you know where that is probably oh, absolutely yep yeah. great those are your songs my songs wow. from the 60s yeah so roger i want to thank you so much for being on our show you've been an excellent guest and for all the work that you're doing so that people can study and enjoy american music now and in the future I hope you have a, a really good year and a very productive year in all the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Okay. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. You can connect with us on Facebook and YouTube at Your History, Your Story, or on Instagram and Twitter at YHYS Podcast. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.